Anyone who has sat down for a broadcast news interview will tell you it's nerve-wracking. Serving as a spokesperson, the face and voice of your company, terrifying. That's why you need to prepare. But when it's live, oh, and you're digging your brand out of a crisis, oh boy, you need to prep. Just like this guy who media prepped within an inch of his life when he sat down for an interview on CBS Morning. Here is the CEO of a company who went through one of the biggest crises of 2023. Can you guess where he works? Take a listen to this talking point, and I bet you will. I worked for PepsiCo for a number of years, and I came here 10 years ago, and I've been in this position for two years. You still like this job? I love this job, and I love the company. Uh And it really is, as I mentioned, an American institution. And it's really, to me, one degree of separation away from the the United States, the, the American flag. The American flag. (laughs) Anheuser-Busch is the American flag. Wow. Heavy, heavy on the talking points. Woo! Welcome to the Indestructible Podcast. I'm Molly McPherson, your crisis communication strategist and your guide through the world of breaking news and popular culture. So join me as we analyze the juiciest moments and extract valuable PR lessons. Now, normally I like to go behind the headlines, but in this episode, join me as we go behind the scenes. This week, get ready to explore the art of media preparation. On this episode, we're going to talk about mastering the media prep, unveiling the secrets of getting ready for your time in the spotlight, the interview dance, find out why so many people go on the defensive, and how you can flip that script, and of course, learn how to dress for success. Have you ever wondered the different types of shows and networks requiring the different types of outfits? What do you wear, particularly when you are crunched for time? I'm going to give you some of my tips, plus a special touch. How to take care of your host, the person interviewing you, that could make or break your on-air relationship. Now, joining me on this episode is a former network news producer who will share the tricks of the trade. David McAlpin is the global head of external communication for Illumina. He oversees all media relations and social media efforts worldwide, including serving as the company's chief spokesperson, which is a huge, huge role. But he's here today because before that job, He spent 10 years in TV news working as a producer. David went from the local markets to network news. So he has a deep knowledge of what happens behind the scenes in local television and on some of the most high profile television news shows. So David is going to share how everything comes together to make live TV happen every day, especially during media interviews. Now, Hop on in to our conversation. So I had a little bit of a weird past. I actually started at KTLA 5 in Los Angeles. I went to school at USC. I started interning there. And then the summer between my junior and senior year, they needed someone to fill in for someone on maternity leave. And I started working there and I just didn't stop. And I started as an entertainment producer for Sam Rubin who you might know, he's lovely and awesome. And I got to do you know the Oscars and the Golden Globes and the Emmys. And I did all the LA stuff. And then ironically, I got tired of the 365 days of sunshine because it's Chicago and I missed the seasons. Yes. <laughs> so then I moved to Seattle where I worked at the CBS affiliate. I did the morning show. I worked the overnight shift, which is tough, but you know, I did it and you know, I was young and working in a big market. So I knew that that's what I had to do. That was your mm-hmm. first like big person job? My first big person job was- Okay. A, so what market is Seattle? What number is that? 12 or 13. Ooh. Look it at was you. Thank you. It was very odd, but I had the experience at KTLA and USC yes. has a great journalism school. So, you know, it was it was a lot of sink or swim though. I mean, the first six months there, I was like, oh, I don't really know if I can move fast enough and I don't know what I'm doing because it was a very fast paced morning show, right? Yeah. And Seattle has a lot of news and there's always some kind of Pacific Northwest tie to everything. And then I moved to Philadelphia. I worked at Channel 6 Action News, which is one of the oh, biggest- Hold on. Give me the affiliate there. WPVI, ABC. ABC. Oh, yeah. okay. So you went from, I'm sorry, did you say 12? No. What I went from like 12 or 13 to four. You went 12 or 13 to four. Mm-hmm. That doesn't typically happen unless it's in a movie. 
Yeah. How did it, is, <laughs> are you just that spectacular? Of a no, it's all timing, right? Like we know that this about this whole career, it's all timing. So I was looking to leave Seattle because I wanted to move a little closer to home. I'd actually interviewed at every station in Chicago, could not even find a freelance job. Because no one leaves those stations. Yeah. And then an alum of USC was leaving WPVI in Philadelphia. I'd never been there. I didn't know anything about the Mid-Atlantic. But I was like, sure, it's a huge station, big number one station in a huge market. So I was like, let's give it a shot. And I was there. You know, The Pope came. The DNC was there. We had some crazy snowstorms. Like, It was a huge opportunity that I didn't no until I got into it because then also the 2016 election, it all came down to Pennsylvania, right? Like oh, wow. it, there was there was a lot of stuff going on there. So, and I loved it. Wow. So you're great. a Chicago boy. Did you start eating hoogies? When yes. You were- oh, Wawa is life. <laughs> I love it. If I did, wasn't wearing this, I would be wearing my Wawa shirt. I love <laughs> Wawa. And so, yes, I'm a big hoagie person. Cheesesteaks are Philly. okay. Did you go then to Philly to national? Yeah, I went to Washington D.C. to be a producer at Fox News. Oh, and, oh, and then you went to D.C. and you and then I went to D.C. At the, at the network, and then I went to CBS in New York. So I got a full taste of network life. You know, I did the White House pool. I did other pool travel. It's funny because I was hired to kind of be like the breaking news producer in the Mid Atlantic because they had everyone who could do White House stuff. But like, what happens if there's flooding in Maryland? Like, you still cover. A region of the country, right? And then I got sucked into White House pool because logistics are a strong point of mine, you know. And then I, you're just doing everything, right? And it was the Trump administration, and nothing ends, and you know, I'm going to Singapore and Vietnam and Finland and all these crazy places, and it was so much fun. But you know, I was also never home, so right, you know, right. that's the that's oh the upside my gosh. downside. Well, here you are at home, and, and here I am at home. with me right yes. now, which I appreciate. I am so fat. Well, people who know me and know me well mm-hmm. know I love television news. Mm-hmm. I love television news scandal. <laughs> um, but I mean, I am, I mean, I'm a Gen Xer and mm-hmm. I, you know, when I went to school, it was all about broadcast mm-hmm. and broadcast news. So this right. has never left me. It's still the idea of putting together a story. Knowing like, how to put a story together. Knowing how to, how to get a sound bite out. Like the skills that I learned in broadcast news have never left me. And the biggest one I use all the time is writing fast. Yes. Okay. Like, you have to be a good writer, right? Yeah, and, and fast. fast. You yes. got to like, you know, if there's breaking news, like, you know, at the amount of times I threw my show out the window five minutes to air and then you're like, you know, breaking news, da, 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 da. You have to know how to be adaptable. Yes. Well, and tell me, so last night I was speaking to someone who works in the news business and, mm-hmm. and you were just talking about, you know, younger people getting into news Yeah. and he was saying how important writing is. So it's important. all about the writing, isn't yes. it? Do yes. Do you think it's a lost art now with people who you work with or are the up and coming students and journalists to be like, are they good writers? No. No. <laughs> no. I mean, I think that there are some people who are really important, you know, they, they've emphasized writing, but I was lucky enough in my career to have people who really emphasize writing, the tease. Why do people want to stick around, right? You know, like the presentation of it all. And now, and I mean, listen, TV news now, you look at local TV, stations are producing 13, 14 hours of local news a day, right? Because it's cheaper than syndicated programming and you've already got the anchors there. So now who might just be doing the five and the six is doing the five, the six, a half hour at 830 on the other channel, the 10 and the 11, the cut-ins, all this. So, and I saw that kind of when I was going through TV news because I started in Seattle in 2012. And then as I progressed through and we got closer to like 2016, 2018, you know, that's when digital really came in. We were doing digital cut-ins specifically for, you know, the mobile app or online. And then when your attention gets spread out, no longer is it the 11 p.m. producer has a 30-minute window to care about, right? Like everyone has to be feeding the news all the time, 24-7. It's a brand. It's not just a station anymore. And... Writing can get lost in that. I mean, listen, we both know like sometimes writing falls to the wayside because you got to get something out. But like there is an emphasis on speed and doing more with less, not so much the quality of it anymore. And I watch local news. Like I still watch Channel 7 here in New York. I watch Channel 4. I still have friends who work all over the place and I love local news. But sometimes I'm like, I'll watch and I'm like, ooh, I would have written that a little differently or like, yikes. 
Yeah. So now we're going to get into three areas, but before we do that, I do yeah. want to, we're, we're going to, I'm going to have, I'm going to ask you one more question about local news, but sure. so you and I are going to talk about what it takes to be, you know, a good guest, you know, a good mm-hmm. interview guest when you are being interviewed. And then we're also going to talk about some of the little PR moves that mm-hmm. you've seen because right. now you've been on both sides, you yes. know, as have I. And then we are going to spotlight an interview that you and I both had a fascination with. Mm -hmm. I believe, no, I think you DM me right after that interview. I did. You were giving me insight. I did. I saw it and I saw your comments and I was like, yeah, I thought it was an interesting positioning of how they did it all. Yeah. Yes. And I may or may not have said on a TikTok (laughs) what you told me. I did not, I did not give any. That's okay. I just said sources say that this may or may not happen. But before we move off, like in terms of of news right now, Mm -hmm. what do you think is the relevance? So I worked in news, television news back in the late 80s, Mm -hmm. early 90s. And then I did a quick stint in 2008. Yeah. Where do you see news from a national mm-hmm. and local point of view? It's relevance, permanence, anything. Yeah. I think local news is actually more relevant than national news because you're seeing the trust kind of shift on all the networks. And when – like I covered the presidential election in 2016. I covered it in 2020. Mm-hmm. I saw the trust of regular people erode – as you know, you're trying to set up interviews with voters in Virginia or Ohio, and everyone's like, TV news is evil. You guys are just going to spin what I'm going to say. Local news still has the power to amplify you know, your local city council people, the mayors, the governors, and smart politicians engage local news stations because that's where they're actually going to get the platforms to talk and speak to the people who are you know, their constituents. National news is great, and I think it's great for a variety of things. But, you know, it's also become like the CNNs and the MSNBCs of the world are more relevant because people are tuning in whenever. Mm-hmm. I don't think that there are a lot of people who are necessarily – it's a nice thing to have on in the background, but I don't have appointment viewing. Where Growing up, I watched the Today Show every single day. Matt, Katie, Anne, every day. Yes. Now, if I'm up at 7, yeah, I'll have something on in the background. But I'm not like waking up to see what the news is. I'm going to my phone first. Right. And seeing, okay, what are the push alerts I got? What are people saying? And so it's kind of like now TV news is a extension of the digital platform that is online. Yes. I, I, it's, it's hard. Absolutely agree with you. And I'm like you. I mean, I was a TV ophile. Like yes. I watched. I was a big Today Show viewer myself constantly, like I think 2007, 2008. Mm-hmm. I knew all of it. But now it doesn't have relevance to me. Yeah. Local is stronger to me than national. And national has these messy storylines. And I, I don't know if you heard this, that the Today Show is having some friction in there. There might be some people being let go soon. Oh, I mean, I've, I've, I've heard that like the Today Show has had friction for, you know, like, I mean, ev- here's the thing. Every morning show has friction, right? Like- Yes. Apple TV would not have gotten Jennifer Aniston and Reese Witherspoon to do a story about that if it wasn't an interesting and dramatic business to be in. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Though NBC, I do think they have a little they have a little too many people on in the morning, but I think it's because they have a bunch of people with kind of pablum personalities all in there at once. Right. Kind of real, but that's just my right. that's just my opinion. Okay. Yeah. You and I could go on and on and on. <laughs> you and I could probably do an hour just on Matt Lauer. I know, oh, I know. Let me ask you oh, a Matt very Lauer, quick yeah. question about uh-huh. Matt Lauer. Yeah. Okay. Only because you know, most people couldn't have this conversation for 30 seconds with me. Yeah. Matt Lauer, and Mm -hmm. we know, you know, what happened to him is that he was exposed for having a relationship with uh, producers slash S producers. One of the producers came forward, you know, with that information and he was, you know, let go with them, you know, like that. They called him in and said, you're out the door. And we heard, you know, the rumors that he alleged to have, you know, a, you know, a lock, you know, on his desk. The button. The button. The The button that closed the door. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is that Could that even be true? I don't know. I mean, listen, I've had so many people at NBC tell me that that's not okay and that that didn't happen. But, you know, it's also like their offices were so tucked away. Like, I don't think that a lot of people were 
you know, over there. I don't know. You know how it works. Someone says something, it spirals out of control and everyone wants to believe it. Exactly. I'm not believing the button story. No. I I don't know what NBC electrician comes in and they say, "Uh, someone had an order for a button to shut a door when they're at the desk. (laughs) Oh, is that you, Mr. Lauer? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, but it was clear. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, blind items about Matt Lauer. Of course. For years. But if the Matt Lauer story happened Mm -hmm. in 2023, yeah. What would have happened to Matt Lauer? Oh, that's a good question. I actually think he would have been canceled faster. It happened pretty fast. Although, you know what? It's interesting because no one saw the opportunity to pick him up. You know, like he, Brian Williams kind of had a second round of, and now granted he did not do what Matt Lauer did. So let me be clear about that. But but in journalistic ethics, it's almost what he did was worse. Yeah. And it's, and it's also like, it's a ratings game. So I was, you know, it was kind of surprising that no one tried to give Matt a second chance on even like a show or like a documentary or anything. And maybe he was also just done with it. I mean, I think now people would have less tolerance for it. I also don't think that in 2023, there would be the environment for anything like that to happen anymore because people are so protective. They are so HR forward. And I think that people would have spoken up about something much sooner than it ever happened. You know, like we heard that there were things happened for years and years and whatever. And I don't think that would be the case these days because people talk and people would report it. Yeah. I mean, that's true. But I think, which I, part of me would say that, but the other part of me says, because Matt Lauer was so valued, you know, at that network and and not necessarily beloved, but valued. He was good. He was good. And I think the reason why Brian Williams stuck around, even though the egregious sin of just embellishing Mm -hmm. his war coverage, which, oh my gosh, I mean, that was awful that that happened. But I think he would have pushed back a little because it was, he said, she said, and it was, I think NBC would have done something to make it go away because back then we were still in the Me Too realm. Yes, you're right. You're right. now I think they would have done something. That's just my opinion. Because it happened right right. after, no, because it happened right after Charlie. I think Charlie Rose was first. Yes. And then Matt was shortly after. And I remember because it's around this time because I was watching the thing. Thanksgiving Day Parade with my friend and Matt wasn't on the Thanksgiving Day Parade and everyone was like, oh, or he was on the Thanksgiving Day Parade, but the energy was off between him and Savannah. And then that following Monday is when he got fired. Oh, no kidding. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That's I remember that. Yeah. See, I could talk about this for a minute. Okay. All right. So let's talk now. So you've been local, you've been national. Yes. Yeah. Now, first, let's just talk about what are some of the things. So first, it just as a producer, what is your job in a sentence or less? What does a producer do? You make TV happen. You know, you make sure that everything happens from beginning to end. You're prepping the correspondent. You're helping write scripts. You know, you're finding all the visuals that go with the story because because TV is a visual medium. You have to have the visuals that go with what's going on. You're there to keep the train on the tracks and make the world go round. Oh, okay. Oh, train on the tracks, world go around. (laughs) What's the difference between a producer and a booker? So a booker is focused on actually calling people... And it could be anything. It could be like a hurricane happened in in Florida and you're trying to find families for your crew in Florida to go talk to. You're scouring social media. You're finding the videos. You're trying to track down people. It could also be trying to book celebrities. You know, you're trying to book someone about either like a scandal or, you know, you're trying to book that celebrity who's got that big thing, you know, or someone's got new music, you're trying to book them. A producer can be a booker or can help in the booking process. And I think bookers are producers and producers are bookers, but it's just the, a lot of people now call them editorial producers as bookers because you are producing something. Right. And so I don't want to minimize that work, but you know, a producer is thinking more of like, how are we going to make this happen? How's this going to look on TV? What questions are you going to ask? Where are we going to do it? Like a booker would call me and say, hey, we booked so-and-so as an exclusive. And then I'd have to figure out like what hotel room are we doing at New York, call the crew, get the time, you know, book everything, like, and then, you know, run the tape back to the station, right. figure everything right. out. So it, it, it's it a is, lot of work. It's all symbiotic. But yes, it is astounding how many people it takes to make TV happen every day. Yes. And I can say this from a PR point of view, when a booker has you and a booker mm-hmm. knows you and a yeah. booker has your phone number, you're going to be booked. And 100%. If you, and if you work with that booker, one of my favorite bookers is Jake at NBC. And mm-hmm. what's great about him is he knows a TikTok-y news story Mm -hmm. because he gets where I bridge because even though I'm on TikTok and I talk like celebrities, celebrities, people know though I'm really a newsie. 
Right. And I can make that, you know, I can translate that. And right. he is one of my, and that guy hustles, hustle, mm-hmm. hustle, hustle, but he's following. And that's why, I, I mean, I love the news business and there's so many, you know, the, I still think it's a very vibrant area to go into with journalism. I mean, I'm telling, you know, my daughter to go into it as well. Okay. So now in your role though, Mm -hmm. as a producer, you've interviewed, you know, lawmakers, Mm -hmm. presidents, secretary of states, heads of states, celebrities, athletes, people in crisis. Give me the best person you interviewed and why. Ooh, like the one that sticks with me the most? Yes. Okay. So actually, this is going to be slightly controversial, but I interviewed Donald Trump for The Celebrity Apprentice way, way, way back when, and it was possibly one of the most fun interviews I've ever done. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. So were you at KTLA when you were doing this? Yes. And we did- As an we did, intern and you were interviewing Donald Trump? I was I was a producer then, but, I, but it was one of those junkets that we did a setup and he was so much fun. He loved the show. I loved the show, right? I mean, it was wonderful television. I was- the show. It was uh, the show television. was amazing. It was awesome yes. television. Like who yes. doesn't want to see Brooke Burke selling hot dogs on the side of the street, right? Like I love like, I know my daughter <laughs> Kate and I, she's in, the one in Chicago. Yeah. We love that show. It we was so it. good. So, I mean, and then other than that, I think But hold on one second. Yeah. You said Donald Trump and you said fun. Bridge those two together. Yeah. Donald Trump he was fun. Well, because so he knew – so he's a showman, first of all, right? He's yeah. an entertainer. So he knew how to like comment on things and you know talk about the challenges. And there was a repartee in the interview that was very comfortable. He and could he, give you a sound bite. In other words. All the sound bites, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I'm sure we'll talk about is you know he was able to give a good sound bite in 30 seconds or less Yeah, okay. at that point in time. Right. Yeah. At that point. Yeah. Now we know things things have changed a little bit. Yeah. But he knows how to package it. Okay. So give me someone in the political realm who you admired that was easy to work with. Uh huh. A positive experience in the political realm. John Kerry. John Kerry. John Kerry was actually really, really cool. He was like, it was when he was, we interviewed him for Nick News when he was the climate envoy. He was super relaxed. I helped relaunch it in 2021. Oh, yeah. I went to school with people. When I was at BU, they went to Nick News. Okay. That's amazing. I love yeah, that okay, show. Cool. This is a great show. Yes. And so we, the first show that we did was about climate. And so we booked him and his team was lovely to work with. He was really great to work with. You know, I'm trying to think, oh, you know what? Who else was Pete Buttigieg? I, oh, yeah. Oh, I just love him. Just super relaxed. You know, I covered him in 2020. CBS had the Democratic debate in South Carolina, the last one before COVID, because it was at the very end of February 2020. Oh, who moderated yes. that if it was CBS? Oh, it was like six people. It was Major. It was Nora. It was Gail. Okay. It was a lot of people. Okay. But it was one of those things where it was Gail and Nora, and then they brought in a bunch of people, then it went back to Gail and Nora. But he just was like his team was very cool. And in those situations, like it is so high stress, right? You've got like 10 people backstage. You're trying to make everyone happy. And his team was just super cool about everything. Pete was super nice. Said thank you to everyone. Like you remember that kind of thing where like yeah. someone who's really important is like thanking the producers who are there, like making sure he has coffee and tea and water, you know, like. Ugh, he seems just like a chill guy. Okay. So before we go on, I have to ask you, who's the worst yeah. out of all of them? <laughs> worst, thing can I say, pers- worst person to deal with. Can I say Donald Trump when he was in the press, when he was in the White House? <laughs> oh, well, well, that's is I mean that and that's kind of Give obvious. Some, um, yeah, that's something people go. Oh, really? I'm trying to think. Come on, you should have. This. No, should I have know. This. Be I pocket David. I this goes back to when I was in entertainment in at KTLA, but Avril Lavigne was not very nice. Um, that's not surprising to me. Though. No, Speed and she was. Boy. It was yeah. It was I was on the red carpet, and I was asking her to kind of do something a little salesy anyway, but she just kind of said something really not nice to me and walked away. Um, like directed at you, like mean girl at you? Yeah, like F off and then, you know, walked off on the red carpet. Oh, and where is she today? Well, I don't know. Exactly. That's her point. If you're not nice to people, then they don't know who you are. You become irrelevant. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Oh my gosh, I could talk to you for hours. Or <laughs> All right. So let's now talk. Let's just go into, let's not go into the newsroom. Let's go into the studio. Okay, yeah. so let's say you're doing an interview. Now, I was someone – I did media training a lot. It was just something mm-hmm. that I always did. But I've seen uh, – there's just kind of less relevance for it right now because I don't think there is as many opportunities out there to be interviewed uh, nationally, you know, unless mm-hmm. you're a part of some big incident. 
or right. even locally. But I do think if you have a very proactive staff, you can get an interview. I mean, there is yeah. some value to that. Absolutely. And certainly too, what applies sometimes in television news with interviews, I think just applies even just in video content. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the same rules are there, but let's just talk about, let's say someone does have the opportunity to sit down for an interview Yeah. and given the choice of doing taped or live, mm -hmm. what would you tell a client to do? Always live. Why? Live a hundred percent because you know, at the end of the day, what you're saying is going to make it on television. Mm. So if you do a taped interview, like we're doing a feature story on insert CEO here, right? You go to their headquarters, you walk around with them, you get the B-roll shots is what they're called. Like when you, you, the, the reporter and the, and the CEO will like literally walk. And then when they're introducing like so-and-so is CEO of blah, 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 then that's when you show the walking shot and then they're sitting down. David, Those, can I tell you something? Can I tell you yeah. something horrible about yeah. this background video? So when I filmed something for ABC in New uh -huh. York for the network, yeah. for their, for Nightline, uh -huh. about Lizzo. Yeah. And so the interview is just stressful enough where you have to prep for that interview. Right. But then she said, we need B-roll. Oh, and yeah. I thought, okay, I am so out of context right now. Like I don't work in NBC. I don't right. live in New York City. Right. And they wanted B-roll of me walking around ABC. Oh, yeah. Mortified. So it's one thing, you know, when I'm walking down the hallway, because it's bad enough, like I already walk like a softball player. And, you know, because I, I, I walk a thousand miles an hour wherever yeah, I go. Yeah. So I have to walk right. slowly. I'm wearing heels. Right. But then they go behind me. And oh, I'm walking, yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, I had a bag with me that moved around my body. Yep. I mean, I don't have body dysmorphia, but when you know you're going to be filmed on national television trial, oh, I know. casual. Mortifying. The walk shot, the walk shot is always, and I always had to prep people for it as a producer, and I do it now oh. on the PR side too. I'm like, you're yeah. going to do this really awkward walk shot where you're going to sit with the correspondent, or you're going to stand with the correspondent, you're going to talk about nothing for 30 seconds as you walk past the camera, but you need it in the editing process. Like it's a necessary evil. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> it really is. It, it was just, evil. it's, yeah, it's, it's awful. So oh. my point is, like, when I've done sit downs with executives before, I've invited news outlets to come do that. Yeah. And I've done it before as a producer too. Those interviews go an hour, right? Sometimes you have 30 minutes, but sometimes they have an hour. And the piece that airs on television from start to finish is four minutes, maybe three, maybe two. So think about how much you're saying in that 60 minutes of conversation and how much that gets edited down and having someone who's been had to edit down that interview to almost nothing and still shaving seconds off of it up until when it airs because people are bumping around time in the show I would always argue that if you have a message that you want to get out there, do it live. I mean, I know that live TV is scarier, right? And that's the flip side though, is when you have a five, seven minute conversation on TV, you know what you're saying is going to be heard by everyone. It's not going to be edited. It's not going to be cut up, but the sound bites will air later usually, mm -hmm. right? But that one interview will live online. It will live on social media and it will be what people see on TV, Yes. And it really cuts down any type of opportunity to edit or, you know, to change the context yes. of an answer because the live interview is there. Now you Absolutely. talk about that interview and you want it to move along. What is the ideal length of a soundbite? 30 seconds. Okay. So when someone is prepping either with a media trainer or even mm -hmm. someone on staff, how do you recommend that they get to those 30 seconds? Are you writing for time? And making it work, or are you writing for content and quality? You know, like what, I know it's what, hard. What do you do there? You have to straddle the line between clarity and conciseness, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever I'm media training anyone, I have my iPhone timer out because the last thing you want is someone to go on live TV and ramble and ramble and ramble and ramble. It always looks bad. The anchors try to cut you off then to move on to the next thing. And then and it it's just, awkward it does, to watch. It doesn't look good for anyone, right? Yeah. So if you, again, like you've talked about, like you've got the one point and then the three points kind of below it. If you can get those points down to some pretty simple sentences, then you can get your soundbite down to 30 seconds. You don't have to add things. You don't have to get flowery with your words. Like you can be direct and easy and concise. And the other thing that journalists have at their disposal that they do all the time is silence, right? Yes. Like if you're interviewing someone and you sit there and you're silent, that people naturally feel that silence. So then they just keep talking. And every executive who I media train, I say, when you hit that silence, you let them ask the next question and it's going to be uncomfortable, but you just let it happen. Don't feel the pressure to fill that silence.
Yes, that is a great tip, but it's I think it's very difficult for people sitting in those interviews. They get yes. very, very nervous. And you're on live TV, you're under the lights. You know, you could have flown in from insert city here the night before, you know, you're up early, there's hair and makeup in your face. All of a sudden you're like, wait, what? It, you know, when I work with male executives, sometimes they're like, what the hell is this makeup? And I'm like, well, it's so you don't look like a goblin on television. Trust me, you're going to want me. You're going to want it later. A goblin. Right? A shiny goblin. A shiny goblin. Or, you know, like you just, you have uneven skin. It's fine. It's just, it makes everything look, you know, just a little bit more matte and real. But, you know, it, there's a lot of stressors in live TV. And if you can get past those, then you're good to go. Yeah. So now when you prep someone for a media interview, so answer this as someone who preps someone, but also as a producer, Mm -hmm. what should someone walk in the door with in terms of preparation for an interview, in terms of how to prepare the language and what they're going to say? What framework do you advise? So a good producer who wants to have a good relationship with the PR people on the other side will give them They won't give them the exact questions, but they'll give you a list of topics that the people want to talk about, right? Anchors are naturally going to want to talk about specific things, right? And, you know, sometimes there's that elephant in the room that everyone has to get out, you know, but you want to have, ideally, the producer will give the PR person a list of topics to so you can focus on, right? And then the PR person should make sure that they have that. And then you kind of have your stories that go along with those talking points, right? You kind of know what's going to be asked. You know, a lot of it isn't going to be out of left field. And then if there is something that's out of left field, then you teach people to pivot where, you know, they answer a little bit about that and then they pivot back to what they really, really know, or that, you know, they get some specific statistic that's cited out of nowhere. But usually I can tell if a producer has prepared or talked to the correspondent, because if they're coming to me with specifics and, oh, they're interested in this, oh, they're interested in that, then I know that, you know, I can go back to my executive with confidence and say, hey, I think that they're going to talk about this, this, and this. If it's a little bit more of a wild conversation, I prepare my executive a little differently where I'm like, you got to be ready for anything. And when I was a producer, I tried really hard to be upfront about what we were doing so that everyone was more comfortable and it was a better piece anyway. Yeah, because I think you know, um, I know this just in all my work, when people sit down for an interview, they immediately default to a position where they think someone's going to do a gotcha. No matter who they're sitting in front of, all of a sudden in their mind, they become Tim Russert and they're mm-hmm. going to be gotcha to death. Um, right. And that's not necessarily the case, correct? No, it's not. And people, you know, I've worked with people on the other side, the other side, who see media as evil or a necessary evil. And I'm like, no, journalists want to do their jobs just as much as the PR people want to do their jobs. And you and I both know this is an industry of relationships, right? Relationships matter. And it's the relationship between the PR person and the producer. But then it's also, if you're talking at a higher level, you know, the anchor might know the the executive or the celebrity or whatever, or they might have some kind of relationship outside of, mm-hmm. you know, the news business or they might have met before, you know, so you want to be able to, everyone wants to do their job, right? No one is there to be mean or to see someone go down. And that's why I think there's this inherent, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go on TV and they're going to ask me really hard questions. They might, but if you can answer them, they're not going to go in harder. Yes. And I think also there is the context of an interview. I mean, there's people who are contributing as a source to a story right. to make the story better, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, more evolved. But then you have an incident and someone needs to speak up and they need right. an answer. That's like a different type. It's almost like an interrogation. Yes. And that's like a different type of interview altogether. But, you know, if you've given that opportunity and you're there, it's transparency, it's quotable mm-hmm. quotes and being more transparent. Have you ever been in a dicey situation in one of those interviews where it was a live interview and it was getting heavy and hard and tense and where an anchor was just pounding? Yes. <laughs> and it's it's not fun to be watching from backstage. It's um, not. Can you shed any more light on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, without going into too much detail, you know, my company was involved in a rather brutal proxy fight earlier this year. And so when we reported earnings during the proxy fight, we did a whole media tour with our CEO in New York City. You know, we took him to CNBC. We took him to Bloomberg. We took him to the Times. Like, we did a full day of media. Okay. And there was one of the interviews where I was backstage. And what's scary is, you know, so I send out my 
schedule at the beginning of the day to, you know, the entire executive leadership team to the comms team. And I'm like, here's where so-and-so is going to be live. So everyone knows to tune in. So you're not only watching yourself, but like you're getting real-time feedback from everyone else who's watching. Oh gosh. Right. And so that's like, there, and there's nothing you can do at that point, right? Like you've prepared them as best as you can, but you know, they're getting asked some really relevant, hard questions and they're not necessarily responding in the way that they should be. And so then the interview just continues to get harder. And then you know, what's going to happen is their phone is also getting pinged. So once they get offset, then they're going to read what has been said to them that has already been said to you. And then, you know, you got to tell them like, just pick up and keep going. Cause it was in the middle of the day and we have more interviews to do in that afternoon. Oh my gosh. I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's, it's hard. Yeah. Oh, it is hard. So when people are doing interviews, what do you either from your wearing your PR hat or your producer hat, mm-hmm. what should people look like? What should be the wardrobe? How should they comport yeah. themselves? Like how do they, how um, can they look best on air? I think you need to think about your audience. So, you know, if you're on a morning show, that's more of your like, I'm a big fan of the like, you know, t-shirt under a suit jacket. I mean, it depends on the industry you work in too, right? But you can have a little bit more fun if you're on a morning show, especially now, the day and age of today's show, CBS Mornings, Good Morning America, everything is like full body shot. So, you know, you can have your shirt open, you can wear high tops with your suit, like you can be a little bit more approachable, yeah, more color, jewel tones, things like that. If you're going on, you know, a business network, then it's, you know, for men, it's, you know, just kind of a basic suit, no loud patterns on your tie. For women, you know, the standard rule is just a basic color, no patterns. Jewel tones are always the best for TV. You know, no weird like sleeves, fringe, anything like that. Yeah. Can yeah. I tell you the amount of stress that I have figuring out just the top to wear mm-hmm. when I do the broadcast interviews? Like that, I know. It's not even what I'm saying. It's, damn, what am I going to wear? Well, so, and here's the thing. Every female reporter who I worked with, mostly on the network side, they would find something flattering that looked good from the waist up and yeah. they would buy it in 16 different colors yeah. and then just rotate through, you know, every, you know, they had other friends who had like capsule wardrobes. So it was always like the yes. same kind of blouse mm-hmm. with the jacket over it. Like if you're doing it every day, then you have your, you know, your TV friendly wardrobe. Um, but if you're not, if you're someone scrambling and they call right. you and say, could you go on in 20 minutes? You're like, sure. Right. And then you send them <laughs> talking points and you're I know message, you're, you're, you're upstairs you're, in your closet looking for I jewel know, tones. I know. And then, and then you're, yes, jewel tones. And then you're trying to throw on makeup and you're right. you know trying to fix your hair. It is a little bit of a, if you're not used to it, but that's why I recommend to people, both executives and then people who want to, you know, be on TV more guests, you know, you build a TV wardrobe. And honestly, how I kind of found success in TV news and my own voice is like you. I watch TV news all the time. I emulated what I heard on the Today Shows and the Good Morning Americas of the world. Mm -hmm. And the best thing to do is to watch TV and see what people look good in, what people don't look good in. You know, I had- I do that, yeah. All the time. And I had reporters would constantly get DMs from people that were like, I love your top. Where did you get it? You know, I love this. Where did you get it? Like they were constantly giving out fashion advice yes. for the dresses that they had. And, you know, like Rent the Runway is a huge thing in the TV news industry because then you're at least refreshing your wardrobe while yes. getting things that look professional on television. So that's a hack that I do. My TikTok hack is I, mm-hmm. I rent clothes. Rent the um, runway. Yes. Well, I don't do rent. That's a little too upscale for me, but I do. Oh, got it. Okay. I but but rent, you rent clothes. Yes. Yeah. But as a funny aside, whenever I do something with NBC News now, mm-hmm. um, it will usually be with Hallie Jackson on there. Yeah. She dresses. Well, not only does she look like me, the younger version of me, but she dresses like, <laughs> like we have the yeah. same wardrobe. Like, yeah. so, like when I dress, I'm like, I have to not wear what I think she's going to wear. And I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. she's wearing something something that literally is in my closet. Okay. All right. So then what about, so we just talked about wardrobe though, but what right. about just the body language? Do you, as mm-hmm. a producer or even in your PR role, what do yeah. you tell the interview subject about their body language? So it's funny because I always tried to, you know, like there's actually always a conversation when you do a sit down interview, not a live interview, but a taped interview when you're like bringing in cameras, what are the chairs going to be? Because the chairs can make the interview, right? If it's like a high, you know, relaxed wing back chair, that can make someone a little bit more relaxed. Some people prefer a stool because it helps them sit up straighter and it helps them pay more attention. Mm -hmm. Some people like a lower seat, you know, so I always, as a producer, I always tried to ask, you know, 
what do they prefer? And some teams came to me with like, they want this chair with this cushion and they want, you know, this. And then some people were like, I don't know, like you pick. So, you know, it begins with that. And then it's all about, you know, making sure that people can have a fluid conversation. So you want it to be well lit. You want people to be, there's always going to be some kind of an angle. It's a little strange. You know, you're never, rarely are you facing each other head on. There's always a little bit of an angle that you have to cheat because you want the two shot, which is where like the wide shot of the interview, you want it to be slightly angled towards the camera, you know, or sometimes you're working in space constraints where you're like, you know, kind of have to be right next to each other. So it can be a little awkward too, but you just try to make the person as comfortable as possible. And like I said, there's a lot that goes into it, right? So if you're in a taped interview, you're getting mic'd up, right? And then a photographer has to run a microphone up the front of your shirt or up the back of your dress. Like, you know, there's all these things that happen before you do an interview on TV that makes you realize you're about to do an interview on TV. (laughs) It's not just like walking up to a press line with a reporter from the Times and they're just writing down your quote, right? It's a little different. So as a producer- Do you know how many men I have had down my dress- Yes. My blouse. Speaking. Yes. Do you know how many blouses I have been up? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Feeding things like, you know, or yes. it's like, I'm like, I'm giving them the mic pack and I'm like, just drop it down the front of your dress. It's totally fine. And I'll catch it. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, you know, it's funny that you're even saying this because just today I'm uh-huh. speaking in New York at an Axios event, which I'm uh-huh. super excited about. Um, but of course, what's the first thing on my mind? what am I going to wear? Not what am I going to say? Mm-hmm. It's yeah. what am I going to wear? And right. I didn't know like, okay, what's the setup? And they sent me the link of the video and I mm-hmm. could see, oh my gosh, they have the two, they have the two chairs and they're white mm-hmm. and they're cushy. And they, I mean, the right. chairs may change and you're absolutely right. right. They're, they're like this. So it's like, oh, mm-hmm. okay. That means my legs will be exposed, my body. Yes. And I'm right. adapting my wardrobe to that chair. Right. And you have to think about like, are they going to see your shoes? You know, yes. do you want heels? Do you not want heels? You know, what's the, like, do you want a, a skirt? Do you want a dress? You know, exactly. for men, it's, you know, I have worked with several executives who are super well dressed from the shoulders to the ankles, and then they have really bad shoes. Yes. Well, for this video, <laughs> the Jimmy Choo's are coming yes, to this video. The Jimmy, <laughs> and of course, of course, because it's Axios and they're worth it. <laughs> But, but you, but you, exactly. But you know, it's like, I've had to remind people like, Hey, by the way, your shoes are going to be on national television. Like, could we, could we go get some different ones? Oh, okay. Gosh, the fun job of producer. Okay. So now those are all the tips to make people look good in their interviews. So look good on the air. Let's talk about the pitfalls Uh and some of the challenges and when interviews may be designed or set up to make you look not so good. Uh And that's some of these contentious interviews when perhaps a reporter or an anchor is going to make it a little difficult for you. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the things that someone can expect if it's more of a contentious or pointed interview? What are some of the things that you've seen uh, reporters or anchors do? So one thing is they will ask a very tough question out of the gate. There's no easing into it. They will ask a very hard question out of the gate to really set the tone of, you know, this is your, you came on to answer for what you did or whatever happened, like start answering. The other thing that you'll see, especially in a taped interview is a reporter or an anchor will ask the same question multiple different ways. Mm-hmm. They will yes. ask it and they'll, you know, they'll ask a question, you won't answer it. Then three questions later, they'll come back to that question and try to get you to answer it again. And so I always coach people in the way of, you know, you recognize that same question. It's okay to give that exact same answer because if you signal to this reporter that you're not going to answer the question, they will stop asking, right? But they're going to give it three or four shots. So that's something to expect. The other thing is, and this is something that I learned in local from like an investigative reporter, they might have a tell with their photographer, like brushing their hair behind their ear or like tapping their pencil or whatever. So the the photographer knows to zoom in because they're going to ask a really hard question. Oh, the tell. The tell. So what are some of the tells that you've actually seen? So there's a hair tell? There's a hair tell. You know, I've seen tapping a pen on paper. There was one reporter who I worked with who, if they shifted their body, the photographer knew that they were about to answer or ask something really pointed or difficult. 
you know, and, and that's when, especially when you have a setup where, you know, sometimes not to get too into the weeds, but sometimes the photographer has their shot where you can see the back of the reporter's head and then the person in the foreground. Yes. But then they know to push in so that it's a tight shot of this person getting this really hard question. That's like the 60 minutes framing. Like, you know, you're yes. like, like this. Yeah. So, you know, I always tell people to pay attention to other people's body language because as a producer, I've had to tell the photographer like, oh, look for this because when this reporter does this, then, you know, this is when the question is going to come. So like really be prepared for whatever could happen. Oh, wow. That is good mm -hmm. intel. And also the risk too, when an anchor or a reporter goes too hard with that first question with the purpose of throwing the interview subject off balance, right. it could really frazzle them to the point where they never get back on track and then it becomes right. a kind of a messy interview. Well, it could be messy. Like my shirt, Mr. Messy. This is this is this is my this is my constant life, right? I mean, you can see it from two ways. One is that if the anchor or the reporter wants to have a news making interview where, you know, like someone like Elizabeth Holmes, right, just completely bombs it, right? Yeah. People are gonna be watching, people are gonna be sharing. Yes. That's the rating social media game, right? Like Elizabeth Holmes tanks interview. However, you also run the risk of, you know, were you too hard on them? You know, were you asking the right questions? Was it a gotcha interview? You know, and with the trust in the media where it is these days, you run the risk of, you know, were you being too hard on this person who agreed to come on the show? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a question and this is what I'm noticing. And maybe yeah. you could tell me too, your thoughts on this. So I worked in the days, you know, either on the news side or in the PIO side or, you know, when mm -hmm. I was in public relations. Do you think the day of the big expose interview, so let's say there's a crisis, there's an incident, yeah. whatever's happening. Do you feel now that people don't choose to do television interviews because they have social media and they can just put out a statement? A hundred percent. You can put out a nice flowery, like wrapped up, you can either type a note on your phone and screenshot it. You can get a nice graphic made, but people don't have to turn to national news anymore to make their statement, mm -hmm. right? And you know that if you put it out, it's going to be covered by every national news outlet anyway. Right. So why risk the interview and exposing yourself when you can just put your statement out there? But then that's where, you know, all the stuff that you talk about comes in about how the statement can really backfire. Yeah. But if you really think that it's not advantageous to do television, which a lot of times it's not, then, you know, just put on a statement. Yeah. Because the expectation was to do a television interview. Yes. The expectation when it was really, really big story, you know, you were doing 60 minutes. Yep. The expectation you're doing and like if the network's called, like you're doing that interview. It when humanized DC, you. Yeah. Yes. When I was in DC, if someone called, that interview was happening. But yes. But now I no. don't think you need to do it. Because it's not, I think previously it was a courageous thing to go on television and say you were sorry, right? It was, like I said, it humanizes you. But when you see these big stories happen, you know, they look to a CEO or they look to a head, you know, of an organization, do the interview. They almost never do it anymore. Mm -hmm. But then one of the biggest stories of 2023 from a corporate point of view, at least from my perspective, at least what I was watching, happened in April 2023. And that was Bud Light. Yep. And the but I call it the Bud Light debacle until someone else can come up with a new name for it. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, that's what I deem it. Why don't you tell us because you even said that you knew people who worked there. Briefly, what happened with Bud Light? Yeah, so I think what happened was, you know, they sent a can. They did a personalized can, kind of like an activation if you will, and they sent a can to Dylan Mulvaney, you know, the superstar trans woman on TikTok. And you know, Bud Light has a very conservative fan base and people didn't like that Dylan Mulvaney got a can of Bud Light. And then, you know, you've seen the implosion of it. You know, now Bud Light was the best-selling beer in America. Now it's Modelo. Bud Light lost a ton of market share. People have left the company. You know, I mean, it was a really public black eye all because of, you know, they like to say just one can, you know, that's one can really screwed up 
a very iconic American brand. Yes. And there's still, it's still reverberating to this day. Certainly there's still, you know, the numbers, you know, aren't where they even close to where they used to be. Mm -hmm. They're now done a partnership with UFC and Dana yep. White. And also, you know, recently too, that the marketing chief in the US stepped down recently. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's funny because now working in PR, everyone refers to it as like what they don't want to go through, right? Like, oh, that was like the big misstep of 2023. And unfortunately, they're going to continue to be that example until there's another example that is that bad or worse. Yes. And I would say because of the business that I'm in, part of the reason why it was so bad was because of how they handled it. And I don't think that mm -hmm. it was necessarily the choice of what they did. It's the choice of how they rolled it out. And what does not get played out a lot or get a lot of attention, even in all the media interviews that I do, it doesn't get picked up as much. Where I think it went sour is not the decision to use Dylan Mulvaney because they worked with a ton of influencers across the right. board. I mean, this was an influencer campaign. It was not a yes. Dylan Mulvaney campaign, but it was the head of marketing who was on a podcast, who wasn't mm -hmm. prepared, who was kind of talking off the cuff and had talked about the market, how, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, I have to memorize this because I say this talking about <laughs> so much, but just dismissing the bro culture of Bud right. Light and wanting to try something new. That's what got snagged was that clip. And it went off from there. And then leadership wasn't prepared for what happened. And that brings us up to, you know, Anheuser-Busch. So just in terms of background for me, I was scheduled to do an interview that day because mm -hmm. the news came out that the CEO of Anheuser-Busch was, you know, coming out and speaking out in the media. And yep. I was contacted by another network to do a news story. But mm -hmm. then as I was you know, watching the news that day and watching the story, I noticed it really wasn't getting a lot of pickup. And right. sure enough, that story with me got canned. And I'm, I was not surprised in the least it could, because it almost felt like none of the other networks or news outlets wanted to give the CEO and CBS Morning any type of traction or any type of buzz right. around their interview. What do you think about that? Yeah. So, I mean, so like when you're in the control room in the morning, right? Like you're in the any control room, you're seeing what everyone else is doing, right? Like 7 a.m. rolls around, your opens rolling, Today Show, Good Morning America, CNN, everyone. You're looking to see what is on everyone's show. Yeah. And if you are, you know, if CBS has an exclusive with the CEO – then you're not going to want to give airtime to the story if the story is going to become the interview on the opposing network. And especially if there isn't like a huge update, like a huge news related update, it's super easy to just take out that story. And everyone does a really good job now of promoting like the exclusive interview. Like they'll start talking about it at 6.30, 6.45. So you know if something's coming, mm -hmm. it's not a surprise. And then you have time to, you know, alter your – I mean, that's the one thing about a show – that I think I would hope that people know. But, you know, when you go on the air at seven, it's a living, breathing two hour broadcast. Things can change yes. all the time. Yeah. So now in this interview, I was watching this interview and I don't normally watch morning television, but I watched mm -hmm. this interview and my takeaway was this was an extended promotional video for mm -hmm. Anheuser Bush. Yeah. This was not a news interview. What say you? I think there were news bits to it, but it was definitely, I felt like it was a situation where, you know, Anheuser-Busch, I feel like used the exclusive to their advantage, right? When you offer a network and exclusive that everyone wants, that's your bargaining chip. And then you can negotiate on the back end, like, oh, we don't really want to talk about this, or, you know, we really want to talk about that, or we want to make sure that you mention this part of the story. And if the network really wants the exclusive, typically there will be that negotiation and they'll agree to it, right? So, you know, and then also a well-prepared PR person is going to make sure that in the morning when the anchors come visit the green room, that they're feeding the anchors, you know, it was just one can. I can't believe it. It was just one can. Can you believe it? It was just one can. And then that's how the interview kicked off, right? You could tell that they'd had a conversation beforehand and then it was kind of like repeated and then it teed him up to have his, you know, very well rehearsed answers. Okay. Very so well I, I have a slightly different thought on that. So I'm going to mm -hmm. play the first clip or, or I'm going to play sure. a clip 
of the first question right out the gate. So we have Brendan Whitworth sitting down, you know, he's on the set, the morning set, and Gail King asks him this first question. Yeah. Number one, we're glad to have you here. Yeah, many to- you. many you. people in your position, Mr. Wentworth, would be running for the hills at this point. Because since April, you all have faced a lot of incoming. How and why did it, did it go so off the rails? Because that certainly wasn't your intention when you did one can to one person. Okay. Yeah. So there's a couple things going on in there. <laughs> right, yeah. So, Gail, I feel as if in that question... And in the, I don't know, in the onboarding, so to speak, Mm -hmm. like she's bringing him in. Everything felt very soft and Mm -hmm. safe for him. It didn't seem, I mean, even from that introduction, this was not 60 Minutes. This was not CBS on Sunday evenings. This felt like she was sitting down, uh, seriously, like she was sitting down with a celebrity. Right. This did not seem like it was coming out hard. And I feel... This is more than Gail just coming into the green room a half hour before air. This feels like it was more, there was more planning there. It almost feels like, could there have been some transactional element to this interview? What say you? Like, I don't think that like, you know, money exchanged hands or anything, but advertising. I don't know. Well, mm, I mean, I can confidently say I've never seen advertising change hands because of that. Now, To be fair, like we've seen like every news organization is a corporation, right? Mm -hmm. CBS is owned by Paramount, NBC is owned by Comcast, Mm -hmm. ABC is owned by Disney. So there is an element of making money here. And, you know, I'm sure that there's always these forces of, well, they're a big advertiser. So blah, blah, blah. I think there was a lot of preparation that went into that interview. You know, I've had executives call anchors the night before. I've put them on the phone with people. So that they can explain their side of the story and the interview usually comes out a little bit softer because they've explained where they're coming from in a less high stress environment. I don't necessarily think there's transactional elements there, but I think there was an attempt to make him feel comfortable to maybe draw him out of his shell to have a more genuine answer. But then when you have someone who, like I think you mentioned on your TikTok, media trained within an inch of his life, (laughs) he's going to stick to his talking points, right? So it could be welcoming him in to make him feel super comfortable at the table. You know, he's in New York. He probably, I don't know if he lives there or not, but you know, he's taking the time in the morning to do it. Um, You know, to try to make him feel comfortable by saying like, most people will be running for the hills, but not you. Here you are sitting with us to try to just like loosen up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I could go along with that. I could go along with that, but it's still, I'm more sus on it because this was such a bad, bad corporate experience for Bud Light and for Anheuser-Busch. Yeah. And even when Gail's mentioning, it's the number of, I mean, she is, it's like she's reading off a press release. It's yeah. the number one, you know, beer company. And so, and I'm not saying like, it's like someone's handing over a bag full of cash behind, you know, Black Rock. Behind right. It. But I feel as if there may be some other element at play that maybe there's some ad package down the road, some six, like, I don't know, maybe I got to start looking for I mean, ad ads. No, I mean, you know, there's always those external forces at play that, you know, on the news side, you never really know how they're shaking out. But I mean, the other thing, and this goes back to my point about a live interview, you know, that there's not a ton of time at the beginning of the live interview to recap everything and rehash everything. Yeah. So the intro was very broad, right? Here's what happened. It was Dylan Mulvaney. Bud Light got some backlash. They were the number one beer. Now they're not. Here's the CEO, right? There was not like, it's not like you and I were sitting down for 10 minutes to go through it and then talk about it at length, right? You knew that that intro was going to be 30 seconds max, very high level. And then he got to start talking about what he wanted to talk about. Okay. So then now here's another clip that I'm going to play that could feed into your argument and also feeds into mine that it feels, it could look, let me just play the clip. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Brendan, we should point out that you're a former United States Marine and you were also at the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. Correct. So you know a little bit about stress, uh, yeah. just a little tiny bit. Just a little yeah. bit. Uh, how did you go from the CIA to Anheuser Bush? Well, I think that that was a really good PR person pushing it on the booker. Like, by the way, he was in the CIA, he was a Marine. You know, it's knowing how to tell a good story. And knowing that the booker and the producer, because there's going to be a booker who books it and then a segment producer working on the questions, the interview, the, you know, the editorial, 
And if you're a savvy PR person, you know how to get with a segment producer and be like, isn't it really interesting that he was in the Marines and he was in the CIA? Like this guy is not some average Joe or some business school graduate who's a CEO. Like he was in the CIA. He was a Marine. Like he knows how to handle stuff like this. And this is where it's coming from. And I mean, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but clearly it made it into the prep packet. And then Nate asked the question. Yeah. And it made him look really good. That Brendan, it made Brendan look really good. Well, speaking of looking really good, let's talk about how Brendan looked. What oh, do you re- great. What do you, yeah, how did he look, if you remember? Like I said, it is the like open shirt. He had fun shoes on because he knew he was going to be at a glass table. It's going to be a full body shot. So he can be the approachable CEO. You know, he's not dressed in the nines in the morning. He's coming with an open, easy attitude, scruff a little bit. Yeah. It's a chance to be fun, to show off your personality a little bit. He's approachable. I mean, it's the same thing. It's the same idea that CEOs will use when they're addressing employees in like an internal situation, right? Like you're not the guy or the girl or the woman, I should say, who sits in the, you know, in the ivory tower of the exact wing and doesn't talk to anyone. You're a person of the people. And he came and he was just approachable and easy and fun to look at. And, you know, people might be like, wow, he's really good looking. He nailed it. There's no doubt about it. He nailed no, that. It, it was so good. I mean, I hope that the people behind the scenes were like high-fiving after that because that was like really good interview. Yeah, absolutely nailed it. His management of the crisis was mm-hmm. a disaster, but that right. I think was a great right. interview. So wrapping up, like if you are working with a you know national outlet, let's say, mm-hmm. so whether it's cable or you're in the networks, like maybe you yeah. get up to the networks. Do you have any bargaining power if you are a guest? Any bartering? What type of power do you have when you are sitting down to do an interview? If you're using the case of Anheuser-Busch, you know that everyone wants to talk to you. So you basically get to, like, you can go to a network and say, I really want to talk to Gail. I really want to talk to Margaret Brennan. I really want to talk to Nora O'Donnell. You can go to NBC and say, I want a one-on-one with Savannah. You know, that is something that guests can do is if they have the power, if they are a newsworthy person, they can say, I only feel super comfortable with Hoda. Mm-hmm. So I want a one on one with Hoda in the morning. Okay. But what let's and, say they're and, not an exclusive, so they have less bargaining power, but they still then, want then to. Then it's gonna be harder if you're not, you know, if like if you're just a guest on TV, there's a lot of like flying by the seat of your pants that you have to deal with, right? Your hit time is gonna change, you know, they might put you in a different studio. I don't think you have a ton of bargaining power, but what helps is if you come prepared with talking points, because you have to remember these producers, and I lived it my whole life, you're doing 80,000 things at once. And especially now, news producers are overworked and they're crazy, right? Like they're just, they're trying to handle everything. So if you can hand them something on a silver platter, like here's my talking points, here's what I can talk about, here's great. You can copy, paste, make it right into the anchor's intro packet. And then, you know, what essentially you served up to them is what's going into the anchor's head when they have their segment prep sheets in front of them. So you can help yourself by being very specific about what you can talk about and have it spelled out in a very neat, clean way, concise to, so that, you know, it just, it makes everyone's lives easier. The more that you can make a producer's life easier, the more you will get booked. Wonderful. Okay, David, this has been amazing. Your behind the scenes, <laughs> um, producer point of view of you know really how to manage a media interview and how to look your best on camera to get your message across. If there was one thing, so you've now worked mm-hmm. on both sides. Yeah. Let's say on the on the PR side of it, or a producer. What mm-hmm. is the last thing that you say to someone? before they sit down for the interview to get them in the right headspace? Oh, that's a good question. I think when I, when I was a producer and I was working with reporters and reporters get nervous before big interviews all the time, you know, I would just say, it's funny. I had a joke with one reporter where I would always say clear eyes or what was it? Clear hearts, full minds, full eyes can't lose. Yes. We would always say the Friday night lights thing before she did a big interview. (laughs) Cause it was just like a joke and it made her laugh a little bit. I always tried to, put people in a better mood, you know, just, and I have reminded people before they go on TV, this is not life or death. Mm, It may feel like life or death. It may feel like like life or death, but it's not life or death. It's just television right now. I mean, 
people will say like if you screw it up you know it could be really bad for the company or bad for you know your career but a moment of levity is always helpful in that last bit of time Oh, that's a good one. I like mm-hmm. that. I was going to, because what I always do when someone's doing an interview or being filmed mm-hmm. or photographed, whatever, is I always tell them, you look fantastic or you look mm-hmm. great because people yeah. don't know what they look like. I know. Well, that's always a common thing too, is worrying how people look. But I feel like if you can interject a little bit of just you know humor in the situation, especially when there's not sometimes humor to be had. It just makes everyone just a little bit more. And that's kind of my personality too. You know, I am by definition, the personality hire in many of the places that I've worked. Oh, I love that. The personality hire. Oh my god. Yeah. So you want everyone to have a good time, even if you're talking about something that no one really wants to talk about. Or that you're not prepared to talk about. So my last interview, I'll end on this. So the the last Mm -hmm. live interview that I did was two weeks ago and Mm -hmm. it was for the Australian Today Show. Even though I can talk about celebrities when I go to Australia, they'll throw in Australians in there and then they'll yeah. throw in things happening locally. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's just enough there that just kind of amps the stress level on me, you know, a little right. bit. Cause then you have the tech and in my office, you know, I have a teleprompter, I have a camera mm-hmm. and yeah, there's yeah. a mic and there's a, this, and there's everything going on at once. And right. I was getting ready and I was already in the control room and they were there mm-hmm. and I was on mic and I had my headphones in and I was with someone who works in the news business um, mm-hmm. on air, who was helping me with this and to, you you know, and gave me that, hey, calm, everything's great, everything's mm-hmm. good. And I said, I don't think I can do this. And he, <laughs> and he, he looked at me very calmly mm-hmm. and said, don't say that, you're on a hot mic. Mm-hmm. And those are the things that people don't think about. You don't think about, now granted, if you weren't standing there, I probably wouldn't have been talking to myself like that anyway. But right. you forget those little tiny things that can hurt you mm-hmm. in an in interview. And that's why it's good well, to have people who are experienced that know what they're doing. And then not to you know go totally off the rails, but remember, that's what got Amy Robach in trouble at ABC when she said the thing about Prince Andrew or with about the royals. And then they clipped it and then it made it out because she was on a hot mic before she was doing an affiliate tease. Okay, it, you had to say Amy Robach, right? Right. When we're <laughs> I know, I know, I know. We could, we could do it again, but no. But I always, oh, but I was my always, gosh. I was always running around like hot mic, hot mic, hot mic. Like that was always my warning to people because, like you know, it's people forget and they start chatty, chatty, chatty. But I think that Amy Robach knew that was a hot mic. Oh, I do, because she, if you remember, she was angry because she said, pissed, I remember yeah. she was sitting there, she was like this, she's going, I had it. I had it. Yeah. Uh-huh. I had this. I had that. I had that. Yeah. I mean, she was, she was bitching. I, I think she yeah. absolutely knew she was on a hot mic. <laughs> she was <laughs> she pissed. Was doing that. Yeah. You could, you could argue that too. Her, you know? Yeah. I because know. they had everything, but because at that time they weren't going to report on that. They were nope. going to report on that stuff. So, but Amy Robach, oh my gosh, what happened to her? And I know. Oh, and now TJ. her and TJ Holmes, they're doing a podcast. The photo that they released where they were like, our silence is broken and here we are. And it was like the prom pose. I immediately, so I'm still on a text thread with a lot of my old CBS coworkers. Oh, yes. And the second it came out, I was like, oh my God, you guys look at this. And we were all like, holy cow. And we were just like, yeah, it was mass chaos. That was the definition of cringe. If there was, if people ask like, what's the word cringe mean? It's the photo of Amy Robach with TJ Holmes. Same we're silenced no more. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Those two. Yes. Those I know. two. <laughs> and what's well, I'm not gonna say what I think's gonna happen, no. but I think we all know how that's gonna play out. Yeah. We all know how that's gonna play out. Okay, David, speaking of things playing out, this was fantastic. Uh, it was so much was fun. So Thank much. you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed that interview with David. Boy, did he offer some important tips on how to manage any type of broadcast interview. And I know what you're thinking. I'm never going to do a media interview. You never know. There's a lot of opportunities, maybe not so much in network news, but a lot of opportunities in local news, especially if you pitch the story. Now, here's the big takeaway from that interview. The way that we interact with news nowadays is changing. There can be soft interviews and there's also exclusives. There's live happening constantly. 
Even today, I just read that MSNBC is going to come out with like a new live programming announcing that Luke Russert is coming back to the cable news network. I think that's a direction where more networks may go, including cable, because it's less expensive. So learning how to prepare for a media interview can help anyone, particularly when when you know the inner workings. And I'm so happy David joined me today on this episode. So be sure to chime in with your takes on today's episode or if you have any tips that you would like to share. Head on over to any of my social media accounts or you can meet me over at Patreon in PR Confidential. That's all for this week on the podcast. Bye for now.